i have the feeling that things are going to stop working today, but so far everything's been working, so i don't know if i'm pressing my luck or whatever. but let's um, get into the data talk we're a quarter of the way through the book, two chapters out of eight. And so now I want to talk about a quarter of the way through A World from Dust, which actually goes with the same chapters. There are some topics that involve entropy and enthalpy. And I also want to um, connect it to the literature. And so one of the things that I've handed out is I've handed out an actual journal article. And I don't require you to read this. But I do want you to have it with you on the test. On the test, I'll probably ask a question that will refer to either this article or the other one that I handed out, which I'll also refer to. So consider this part of your textbook, OK? Um, and I'll try to do some sort of thing where you look at the actual data. I want you to see real data. The one thing I couldn't do in the book was I couldn't have actual data. Um, we, because we had, we had actual data, but we always drew it. Actually, Mary drew the illustrations for the book, um, if you see the, the graphs. I mean, not the ones that were very artistic. Right, right. the graphs, but, but our, our artist could not handle the graphs. She <laughs> needed somebody else to do it, and that's what Mary could do. So um, we have a personal connection to that. But you can, so um, you, you can enjoy all those. Those are real graphs with real data, but they're always processed in a certain way. I want you to see the original data, and I want you to see how the topics connect between A World from Dust, Atkins, and the actual literature. Okay? So that's what we're, we're doing today, and we'll, we'll have about three or four stories that will be of this sort of mode. And they're, they're, we're ultimately going to get to the question of why did the universe cool as it expanded, which is a chapter one through three topic in A World from Dust. And the answer is entropy, as you might have guessed. You know, you can, uh, you can guess heat, enthalpy, or entropy for anything basically involving these first three chapters. Now, our, I'm going to ask you to be a little more specific on the test if I ask a question like that. But it's also, I want to point out that those type of questions are what I want you to be able to answer on the test. Um, I might, uh, to answer it specifically and to point out homework problems that have to do with that aspect of entropy. And so, we actually have all three laws of thermo in this. Remember that the first law was chapter one, the second law and third law were chapter two because those involve entropy. Chapter one just involves energy being transformed and that's what's happening when you have work and heat being transformed and you have processes going on. So today we're going to build bridges between all of these uh, three topics that we do, Atkins, A World from Dust, and the literature. And we're going to focus on how can we understand this as physical chemists. So you might rem remember a version of this. This is the original version of the, um, of the A World from Dust graph that is in chapter three, I think. And what it is is it shows the abundance of all the elements in the universe. This shows the presence of all the elements, where they can be and how they are related to each other. This shows the abundance. And so this, these are two different things, but they're definitely related. And the one thing that you can see that's re related is definitely what happens to abundance as you increase an atomic number. As you have more protons and more neutrons, you have less and less of each of those things. By the way, the whole thing about the weird, uh, the weird fact that we have so much carbon that there is the weird resonance level that results in there being more carbon than we think there should be, it's hard to make carbon because it's hard to make lithium, beryllium, and boron. So like these are the three rungs in the ladder that aren't really there. And you notice that they really stand out on this graph. It's really easy to make hydrogen, super easy, easy to make helium. But these three, if you have to build things up by smashing them together, it's really hard to get number three, four, and five. And so to get to number six was a problem. And that was the issue that was discussed in the book. But the main thing I want to say is that this is, uh, this is organized in a certain way uh, by the general trend that as you get bigger, you get less abundant. And these actual abundances, the one thing that you might notice about this is that there's a different line for odd versus even numbers. So that shows that it's not just the number of protons that you have. There's something about having an odd number of protons that is slightly less stable than having an even number of protons. Now that's weird physics, that's not chemistry anymore, but it has to do with the strong nuclear force. 
It has to do with the stability of nuclei. And it turns out that these nuclei are slightly more stable, but we still have a bunch of them. So this is physics. On a chemical time scale, we aren't usually going to be turning lead into gold as much as we wanted to, you know, as where chemistry came from, the desire to turn lead into gold. But there's not much of either lead or gold. They're, they're way down here. Here's lead. And there's actually more than usual of lead for some uh, weird reason there. But the thing about that is that you have to use abundant materials to make an organism. You have to be able to find the atom to be able to build an organism out of the atom. And so if you take the, the, humans, the elements in the human body by weight percent, and you make a graph of that, it's actually pretty roughly similar to the graph of general abundance in the universe. Copper, manganese, cobalt, they're all on this side of the graph, the things that are present but low. And in fact, they're all sort of in this part of the graph because you can't pull from this very part of the graph. There's too few of those atoms around. So you can pull from kind of the, this side of the graph, wherever you're above this level of my hand right there. And you can see that, in general, there's um, the lighter elements with the single letters are used more often. And that's why when we're doing biochemistry, we don't have to worry too much about uh, drawing too, mu too much of anything that has two letters, except for the occasional iron and the occasional manganese and things like that. So we are made from what's around. And you see that most of the universe, because this is a log scale, it's even worse than it looks. Most of the universe is still hydrogen. But parts of the universe have been built up into things that are bigger. This is the area that we can pull from if we want to use life. By the way, you can probably make an argument right here for why we don't have any scandium enzymes, uh, just because there's not enough scandium around to make an enzyme out of. And that would be an argument that would probably apply anywhere in the universe. Now, it's interesting. We can look in this area, and we can still see some things that are excluded. For example, we don't see any titanium enzymes. But that's because we have a better option that's even more abundant. We don't have any aluminum enzymes. We can find a chemical reason for that. It has to do with aluminum being plus 3 and 2 sticky. And we don't have any silicon organisms. We have it used as shells. We don't have it actually used. I mean, putting it as a shell is one thing, but actually using it chemically, we don't have any silicon organisms. And part of the reason may be related to the fact that we just don't have as much silicon. Again, if carbon does the job, if carbon does the same job and there's more of it, then we'd use carbon. It turns out that carbon even does a better job and there's more of it, so there's no reason to use silicon. Nickel, we don't use anymore. And so there are other factors that remove elements from this. But we start with this area of the graph. And that means we start with the top of the periodic table. So all these elements are arranged by the periodic table. And uh, of course, we're celebrating. Have you all heard that we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of the periodic table this year? It was a big deal at the American Chemical Society meeting, but I'm not sure it's too big in other circles. Uh, I, keep, I keep trying to figure out if there's some way that I can say, hey, there's a book about the, ev the periodic table and evolution if you really want to read about that, but that's kind of a small audience. But 150 years ago, Dmitry Mendeleev had insights. They had collected enough data. And people had noticed before that there were patterns. But Mendeleev was the one who looked through the false data and saw the real data and saw the real patterns underneath all of the data. And he literally had cards on a table that he moved around. And he said that these things are like these other things. He probably said ruthenium is like iron. He said things like um, boron and aluminum actually could go together. I'm not sure exactly what he did, but he did things like that. And it was the up and down relationships that he really pulled out. And the really amazing thing is that they seemed to come in groups of eight. That was, uh, it was called the octet rule. And he had a number of other insights, but the, uh, the idea that there's this recurring number of eight, and you can still see that number of eight if you look up at the, topper, uh, the upper edge of the periodic table. Okay. So Mendeleev did that based on limited data 150 years ago. Now, what if we took the same data today and we gave it to a computer? Okay. Now, we've collected more accurate data and more data, but the same type of data that Mendeleev had. 
melting points, boiling points, ionization energies, things like that. What if we gave it to a computer and asked the computer to remake the periodic table? Would we come up with the same thing? If the computer is completely blind to anything but the data, the boiling points, the physical data. So to do this, we use a process called Principal Component Analysis, or PCA. Has anybody taken a class with Dr. Pierce in particular where she's talked about PCA? So which class was it where she talked about it? Right. OK. Yeah, a lot of her research has to, has to do with PCA. PCA is letting a computer group things together that are similar based on a whole bunch of data, and you don't know which data are important. It's letting the computer decide from the patterns that these things are more like each other than these things are like each other, you know? And in fact, somebody got the idea, well, what if that's like making a periodic table? That's what Mendeleev did. It, it, the computer puts cards on the table, and it moves them around until the ones that are close to each other are similar. And that's what Mendeleev did. So maybe, maybe the computer could do it. So Dr. Pierce is the expert on this. She actually does research with it. And it's really cool. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what she does. And she can definitely correct me on many of these things when, I, when I'm done. This is actually from her. It's a PCA tutorial. Let's say that you have a bunch of tw uh, 20 samples. And this is a data, uh, this is a data processing algorithm. It doesn't matter what these numbers represent. It can represent anything that you measure about them. But let's say you have two different variables. And you have 20 samples. So like, you know, one, one variable might be related to color, one variable might be related to reactivity or temperature even, you know, or something like that. Okay. So looking at those, can you put those together in groups? It's kind of tricky. And it's especially tricky if you end up with 10 variables. This example will show you at a simple level how to do it for two variables, and then the computer will be able to um, extend that to 10. What you do is you plot each variable on an xy axis. And so you end up with a set of points like this. And so you can see that there is some sort of relationship on the xy axis that you can see uh, pretty easily. You call that the principal component axis number one. And so it's just a line through the data, and it's the best, the easiest line to fit through the data. But the thing is, there's also another scatter. They don't fall exactly on that line. There's another aspect to the data that might explain the groups of it. Uh, and so you actually would, would say that, OK, the data could fall along this line, and that could that, that, the data are separated along that line. That's the way to say it. The data are also separated along this line, which is at right angles to the other line. And maybe there's information in how the data are separated from the line. This has to do with like regression analyses and errors from regression, actually. But I'm, I'm not going to ask you to do it. I'm just going to ask you to understand that the computer is drawing lines through the data. And then it gives a score for how far that point is away from the line. For each point gets a score. How far is it away from the principal component axis for each of these things? Like this would be the score for principal component one for that, vari for that variable, for that data point. And this would be the score for principal component two. You can use those scores. By the way, looking at this, you, if you had to group these data into two groups, how would you do it? You kind of say, I mean, you do it by the quadrants, right? You know, these are clearly together. These are clearly together. This is a way for the computer to actually do that and for the computer to do it for 10 variables at a time. Okay? So, and then you can do, there's a thing called the loading, where you take the angle of the line, the slope of the line. And you, uh, this is where uh, Dr. Pierce would be very helpful to actually explain this. But she calculates this. The main thing is you can do this for a large data set of thousands of variables. You don't have to know what's going on. You're just looking for groups. How do they group together? And it's very powerful, actually, because it can pull out relationships that you didn't know were there. So if you actually take the data and plot out their scores, you can see that there are uh, sort of two groups. There's one group over here, and there's one group over there. And they're mostly separated based on principal component number one. 
you know, so um, that's what we can see with our eyes, and this allows us to do it mathematically for much larger sets of data. The way that she actually does this is um, she actually would analyze gasoline. And back in the day, actually before there was all this construction for Lake Union, uh, there used to be a biodiesel place where you could fill up, I don't think it's still there anymore. It was just down at um, the Mercer exit, sort of the southwest edge of Lake Union. If anybody knows of a biodiesel place there, maybe it still exists, but I assume it's like everything else has been torn up and um, built over by now. But there used to be a biodiesel place, and her project had to do with going around the gas stations and like analyzing their biodiesel, like pumping it into the gas and then analyzing it to see if it was what they really said it was. And of course, you can imagine if you're trying to make money off of biodiesel, maybe you can, it's more expensive, maybe you can say it's biodiesel, but it's not really biodiesel, you know? So she was like checking for that. So she gathered 210 gasoline, uh, or a bunch of gasoline samples and ran them each through a chromatography column and collected data. And basically this is just an ionization signal. So this just means there's something in it that lit up. You don't know what it is, something ionizable. And uh, you have this pattern that goes with this particular sample. So she got the samples from five different gas stations. And by the way, I don't think she says it here. I, I think on a later graph she says it. But can you guess which gas station goes with which? T for gas station? Texaco. Texaco. S, Shell. M, Mobile. And I forget what C is. Oh, thank you. And then A is Arco. Now, I want you to guess, before we even look at the data, which of those five stations do you expect to be the outlier from the other ones in terms of just the properties, possibly quality, but we don't want to throw any stones here, but the properties of its gas. Which one would you expect would be the most different from the others, maybe the cheapest gas of the five? It's kind of Arco, right? You know, uh, that's kind of their thing. Okay, so she's going around and she's going to check. Is there something, does Arco gas give me a different chromatogram than the other four? Can we automatically classify them? Okay. And so that's what she did. <laughs> there you go. Your intuition is right. Arco is way down here. So we, we, don't know, we don't know what these, well, it's not necessarily bad. I mean, maybe it's good, you know? It's just life doesn't work out that way. It's kind of like heat and, heat and work, right? Yeah, it's just a guess. But the, the interesting thing also is she got um, the, oh, I thought it was Texaco, but it's actually Tesoro. That shows you extrapolating from limited data, the issue. But um, she found out that these were all like this. And also, Arco has the least precision. We're not even talking about accuracy here. We're talking about precision. Um, but the thing is, these are all different PCA scores, and it grouped the ARCO samples together, not knowing anything about them other than that they had this particular shape to the chromatogram. And those were actually, they had to do with how high the peaks were and how far out they were. Okay, so there, that's actually an example of the retention times were a variable, but each of those like the pattern was a different variable, and the height of the peaks was a different variable. I think she did, um, is this how she ran it? She doesn't say how many variables she used, but it's more than two, I can tell you that for sure. Yeah, but it found the, 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 the variables which have the greatest separation, and those are the two axes that we have here. So the mathematics of how it works is really cool, but I mostly want to focus on the effect. And it, it also addresses the major question of what are the personality types. You know, everyone know they're Myers-Briggs? Okay. So um, the thing is, all of those are built on psychologists. Basically, they, they, psychologists try to collect data and be precise, but it's really hard on a human personality to not let your biases creep in. Okay. Um, so what if we took all of the data for personality tests, and we asked the computer to decide, are there really just four types of people in the world? Can you group these personality tests together to say 
how many groups there are, just like it can group the chromatograms together to say this one came from this one of the five different gasoline companies. And so what they did is they actually, um, they actually took the computer and we, they gave it blind and they were able to take 1.5 million participants' data to put it together with lots of different personality types and they found robust evidence for at least four distinct personality types. So everyone's right when they say four types, you know. Um, they, they tend to be right because that's what the computer came up with. Of course, one of those types is average and it's like, who wants to be in that type? You know, you'd never actually do that. These are the four types. And the four types, um, it actually separated them on five psychological sort of variables is what they did. The four types have different, distinctly different levels of the variables. Now, lots of error here, big error bars. But these are distinct groups that have neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness. Um, and these are relatively independent domains. You can be agreeable without being open, you know, it's that kind of thing. You can be extroverted without being neurotic, you know, and things like that. Um, so the, the thing is, the average personality type will actually have uh, relatively low openness, but above average in all the other four areas. Then you have the person who is more extroverted and less neurotic, and they end up being more self-centered. The person who is reserved is uh, less neurotic and less open, actually about average with extroversion, um, you know, and, and sort of average with, with these. But it's, it's a question, and then there's the role model, less neurotic, high on everything else. <laughs> so you can decide for yourself which of these you are. Um, Probably I am agreeing with the fact that this is green because that's my favorite color. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I'd probably have to put myself in that category. Um, but the, uh, no one's going to put themselves in the self-centered category except for the people who really belong there. You know, that's, that's one of the tests right there. But um, the cool thing about this is it's really powerful, can take a lot of data. So let's take it and let's give it this data. We won't give it... Um, I'm not sure if they gave it the data on the right. I don't think they, I don't think they even gave it an atomic number, because that would be too much of a hint. That's, and that's also n not what Mendeleev had. He had lighter or heavier, but he didn't, definitely didn't have atomic number. Maybe atomic weight was, would be there, and radius, ionization energy, uh, um, electronegativity, and this is another ionization-related thing. Energy units, by the way, kilojoules per mole. And this is what the computer did. It was given that data, slid it around on the table, and it found these different groups. In fact, it didn't just find the different groups, it had them in the right relative orientation for the whole uh, table. And so it came up with the, the two axes that it thought separated them most. And if I color them according to this table, at first glance, it doesn't look too much like a periodic table. But remember that even this is sort of a, the way this is arranged, it's a little bit of an artificial construct in the sense of you have the light stuff on the top here, you have, uh, and you have like the, the halides over here, you have the, um, you know, you have the uh, group one over here, group two's right next to it, and they're even up and down in the right way. So I just thought that was really cool, and, and in honor of Mendeleev and his table, now we can have a computer do it, but it still uh, looks a lot better the way that we eventually uh, did it as chemists. I, th I think that if we did it like this, it would not be on the wall of every chemistry classroom. You know? So the human brain needs a little more than this. But the groups are real, the groups are universal. The other thing about this, these data would be collected the same way on every single planet. The math would work the same on every single planet. So this is a universal relationship. And that's why I talk about, um, that's why I think it's cool about being a chemist because you can, physicists can talk about the whole universe, but so can chemists, I think, you know, um, because we have the same periodic table for everything. So I want to show you the paper. Um, I actually want to, I want to make sure this is working, and then I, I will record this for a different